Welcome to the 455th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today, I welcome public health ethicist and historian Michael Udell back to COVID calls. As a reminder, you can catch COVID calls live on Twitter and on the COVID calls YouTube channel, and you can hear COVID calls anytime recorded as podcasts on iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Okay, we're going to jump right into the conversation today, and let me introduce my guest. I'm really glad to bring him back to COVID calls. Michael Udell is Vice Dean and Professor in the Arizona State University College of Health Solutions. He's a public health ethicist, an award-winning historian whose work focuses on the history and ethics of genomics, the history of the race concept, and the history and ethics of autism research. He's published more books than I can list right now. Let me just name one, Race Unmasked, Biology and, the, and, Biology and Race in the 20th Century, which appeared with Columbia Press in 2014 and was the winner of the 2016 Arthur J. Weisseltier Award from the American Public Health Association. And I should also mention here on a lighter note that he performs in the long running improv comedy show, Study Hall in Philadelphia. Michael Udell, it's great to see you. Welcome back to COVID Calls. Scott, great to be here. Um, hard to believe it's been almost two years since I've joined you. I think I was early in the pandemic call, probably April of uh, 2020. Is that about right? Yeah, you, you've got a, a better memory than I do. Uh, I went back and looked and I uh, had you on April 23rd, 2020. You were the 29th wow. guest and I had you on with David Barnes um, and we were talking about the history of public health in, in Philadelphia. And if you can believe it, as of that day, Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center was reporting 47,272 deaths from COVID. And at that point, it was over 1,000 from the previous day. And mm -hmm. so that rate of increase is something. I mean, that was the terrible April. Yeah. Yeah, and here we are, six million dead. Country still struggling to understand the role of public health in our lives in the middle of a terrible pandemic or at the sort of next later stage of the pandemic. I, I don't even, I don't even know what to call it at this point. The transition from the pandemic stage to the endemic stage, but it's been, it's been a messy, messy and dangerous and awful ride. How do you talk about this particular moment in the pandemic? I mean, you're a historian, so you're able to take the longer view, but the, the urge to, to normalcy among people and among public health officials, seemingly, is very strong. And I've noticed it leaves people in a very difficult position just in how to talk right now. We're, we're not endemic. It's still pandemic, but it's also masks are coming down. I mean, how do you characterize this period of time? Oh, a mess. <laughs> I mean, is, that, is that clinical? Is that, is that clinical? That's my historical <laughs> ethical perspective. It's a mess. A mess phase. Yeah. I think the, the, the last time that we, we dealt with a global viral pandemic of this sort, and of course there've been other global viral pandemics since, um, you know, was the was the 1918-19 flu, but we were not unused to dealing with, you know, both pandemic and endemic illness in a way that I think really challenges, especially Americans, but people globally, um, throughout this entire COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there, of course, have been other pandemics and epidemics over the last century. Um, but this is global in scale um, in a way that, uh, you know, is, is an equal opportunity infector for the most part um, in a way that, you know, perhaps we haven't seen it in, 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 different, in, in different ways since, since that. I, I just don't think we were, we were prepared for this, which, 
speaks to the failure of public health. And I don't think it's, it's not just, you know, a political failure, although there has certainly been a political failure over the last two years. Um, and I don't mean the, the national political failure, the global political failure. I mean, the political failure of my field to figure out how to capture the public spirit and imagination in this very difficult moment. Um, I, I just think, I don't know. I, I like many other both public health professionals and also public health historians, you know, have to evolve with this moment that keeps evolving and keeps changing and keeps taking us to very different places. All the while people, as you said, are tired, they're weary, they wanna get back to normal with rates of Omicron as an, as an example, going down very low right now. People feel safer as they should. People should feel safer now. But what does that mean for how we should act and behave? And I think there's a wide range of opinions on that. Um, if you go to Twitter, uh, you know, there are some very strong opinions in both directions. Um, and there's not a lot of room for, for the subtleties of, of public health practice to come through at this moment in a way that people feel safe and protected. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to follow up a couple of things that that last point first. Um, I was talking with Virginia Heffernan last week about this and um, and the narratives that we get committed to. And I'm as I'm as guilty of this as anybody, I think. And it's hard when you get committed to a certain narrative, let's say government mismanagement, uh, risk communication failure or other narratives that have been out there. Uh, the disease isn't real or, or vaccines don't work. There's a lot of them out there. You can choose one. And it has seemed hard um, for people to, even in, when new evidence is presented, it's hard to get off your narrative. And I think about that in two ways, both in terms of people, you know, just how they process information that's coming in, but also on the public health side, people who have to try to figure out when data tells them the pandemic is changing, how to communicate that. So I guess that's the, my setup for the problem of the risk, the risk communication problem throughout. What have you taken away from these two years about that problem? I mean, anything that's been learned that can be applied or pitfalls that we fell into to be avoided next time? Well, I, I think one of the problems, you know, out of the, the gate very early in the pandemic is that, you know, the the language of science was foreign to most Americans. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, for example, Tony Fauci and the CDC and the federal government all said for the first couple of weeks, don't wear masks. Um, and then came back very quickly to realizing that this was, you know, an airborne illness that they then said, we need to wear masks. And I, you know, I think, the literacy, you know, the availability of people to understand the literacy of science, the language of science hurt us very quickly. Um, and the ability to, you know, bring people along on what was going to be a really terrible and difficult ride was almost lost very early on. And, you know, you can blame Donald Trump talking about injecting Clorox into your veins and, you know, shoving lights down your throat, whatever, you know, wackiness was coming out of the White House. But it was also very hard for people to understand and to pivot constantly, especially in those first few months, um, to, to taking in new information. You know, science is a process. It is one in which we learn from mistakes, Un learn from new evidence, build on that to make better decisions to move us forward, especially the science of public health. It's imperfect. Um, and I, I think we lost the messaging right out of the gate because people stopped listening very quickly, both because they were scared, because we were in this strange and very difficult political moment separate from um, the pandemic. Um, and because we hadn't seen anything with this kind of force, and again, not to discount the other, you know, uh, pandemics and epidemics like HIV or Ebola that hit, you know, very hard, especially in certain communities globally. But 
Here in the United States, we could say with AIDS, well, it affects that community, even though, of course, it affected all of us. Or with Ebola, it you know was limited in in certain parts in a certain part of the world, and you know barely touched us. So I, I think very early on, the, the the danger of of public health failing this moment was pretty clear. Um, and with the politicization of the vaccine, that has become even more clear. Just this week, um, the Surgeon General of Florida stated that children should that he would not be recommending children. Uh, get the COVID vaccine, which is, you know, contrary to all evidence um, and plays into conspiracy theories and misinformation online and risk communication in that context is really hard. Never mind all of the, the bad information that, you know, people have found a way to integrate into their lives on a, you know, an hourly basis. Mm -hmm. Um been, communicating risk in that context, I think, has been very difficult. And the CDC um, has not done itself any favors. Um, you know, I, I don't know where the crack risk communication team has been, um, but for the most part, uh, it has it has really struggled. I wanted to let's keep going with this for a second, since you mentioned the Florida case. I mean, I think it's going to get harder before it's going to get easier. Because in a state like Florida, I mean, you've been following the anti-vaccination, not just vaccine skeptics, but the anti-vaccination movement. And rolling back childhood vaccines is on their agenda. And that seems to be something now that legislators in Florida and other states are going to take up. I mean, I worry that this Surgeon General's move in Florida is the Trojan horse to then open up the possibility of just making all childhood vaccines elective for school attendance. Now, of course, there's the Supreme Court will have something to say about that. But I mean, the, I, I guess my my question is, do you feel that we're entering into an era when these battles that got tested out during COVID, particularly among those who had a, a pre-existing agenda, they're now going to get harsher, worse. And the data is still, particularly around schools, is still, you know, inconclusive. Even experts who agree with vaccination disagree about the return to school and the way it should be done safely and masks and various things. So there's a lot of fog of pandemic, even among people who who are in good faith and agree. But my worry is that now we're entering a new phase when, um, for various reasons, some state legislators are going to try to go much further with the vaccine issue. Yeah, I mean, I, we should be grateful that vaccine uptake across the board, with the exception of COVID, remains very high. So like we're, we're starting from a point of strength. Um, and I think that, you know, my hope is that, you know, people will remember the success of all of, you know, the, the childhood vaccines that have very successfully prevented, you know, a host of dangerous outbreaks, um, and that people continue to, to vaccinate their kids. But, you know, we're, we're living in an era of misinformation. Um, the hope, of course, is that we are able to you know, continue to, to message positively in public health. And I think social media will play a key role in that going forward. And I think we've, in public health, have um, misunderstood perhaps the power of social media to be leveraged against us. And maybe, you know, going forward, we will be able to, to, to be much more aware and savvy about those issues. Let's come back to history for a second. I'm sure in the last two years, you've relied on historical examples, certainly did when we talked on COVID calls two years ago to try to make sense um, of this moment to people, particularly around issues of inequality and what they should be watching for in terms of the difference between a virus which can infect people biologically versus the society in which people exist, which will condition if they have health care, various other things. Have you, which examples or which histories have you found yourself going back to in order to make sense. And, and I'll just say for myself, um, I thought I understood the history of HIV AIDS pandemic before COVID, and I really didn't. And with lots of guests and additional reading, I have a much deeper understanding of that. So that's been a touchstone for me. What about you? I mean, I, I think that there are, are two, two issues, you know, in, 
a few months after we spoke, uh, we published a paper in science that had uh, 70 signatories. It was written, it was a follow-up piece to a 2016 piece that I wrote with Dorothy Roberts at Penn, Sarah Tishkoff at Penn, and Rob DeSalle at the Museum of Natural History, um, calling for the NIH to rethink how um, race and other population identifiers are used and misused in biological, particularly genetic and genomic research. Um, paper generated some interest in 2016. There was an election that changed the course of the country for the moment. 2016, uh, I mean, sorry, in 2020, we started like many of your guests pointed out in some of the shows I saw early in the pandemic, the way in which inequality wasn't only um, rearing itself in who were the earliest victims of the pandemic, um, poor um, black and brown people particularly, um, but the way in which their deaths were, or their, the, 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 the burden of illness in those communities was being um, used to, to write about both popularly and in the scientific literature about the biological nature of the disparities and deaths between um, white and black and brown people from COVID. And of course, you know, those, those, those claims don't explain the, the differential in, in death. Um, those relate, of course, to, you know, structural issues like racism and housing and employment factors. Um, and, you know, it, it makes me think a lot about the way in which public health itself as a field evolved to study disparities, but to in many ways remove itself from the politics of those disparities. Um, and, you know, of course, public health is engaged in intervention science and developing ways to, to remediate those disparities. But, you know, to, to see a literature start to rise again about the biological nature of health disparities at a time, you know, of, of great crisis uh, was very disconcerting. We wrote this follow-up paper in 2016 calling attention to this issue, again, calling on the NIH to, to fund a National Academy study to rethink how um, race and other population descriptors are used in genetic and genomic and biological research. Mm. And finally, in February of 2022, the NIH funded that study and it was launched. So the National Academies is now engaged in this issue which I think from a historical perspective is really important mm. uh, to leverage this terrible moment to maybe make some changes in what kind of data the NIH collects around population and ancestry and self-identified race and racism and then a host of other social and environmental determinants. So I think you know, that's an example of history rearing itself, um, but there also being some important pushback to maybe make some change. Um, of course, claims about racial differences in, in outcomes relating to COVID persist, but I'm hopeful that some change will happen. The, the other historical issue that I look back a lot on um, is the case of Mary Mallon, um, Typhoid Mary, as she was unfortunately popularly nicknamed by the press in New York at the time. Um, she was a cook, uh, an Irish immigrant woman, um, who uh, was um, a carrier of typhoid um, without actively being sick. And um, I, I think there are a lot of interesting parallels to COVID in terms of, you know, uh, people having COVID, but not being sick from COVID, um, you know, people able to infect others without having active infection, what it meant to protect oneself in the context, and of course, Mary was famously um, uh, coerced into uh, uh, or, or sequestered on North Brother Island in in the East River in New York for for many years of her life, um, and uh, you know lost her freedom. Um, and the story of Ma of Mary Mallon is tough because here was a poor illiterate woman who was clearly singled out for her behavior um, and for the fact that she had a disease and she was spreading it. But the, the thing that um, I think we, we overlook in Mary's case and is something that I've been thinking a lot about is you're generally very sympathetic with Mary as a, as a historical figure. 
Mm -hmm. um, because of the way in which her vulnerabilities made her the one that was singled out as opposed to others who were carriers of typhoid. But there was also a certain selfishness in Mary, uh, you know, or an inability to understand the science of the times that reminds me mm. of the way in which people, you know, it was, it was the summer of 2020, were gathering in, you know, you know, lakes and pools and, you know, having big parties and spreading COVID without worrying about what they were doing to the people around them, even if they were asymptomatic. And, you know, I think not that Mary was selfish. She was obviously living in a different time with a, 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 a limited um, level of literacy and scientific knowledge, but we have much more ability to educate ourselves today. So this notion of selfishness as a factor in, in public behavior and public health behavior feels really powerful in our country over the last two years. And it's, it's not, you know, people talk about freedom and people talk about, you know, other traditional places where rubber meets the road and in limiting people's um, rights in public health, but the way in which people have and can, and can be and have been selfish in this context has really just blown me away consistently. Well, thank you for that example to think with. And, um, I want to maybe ask you a couple of things related to that. I mean, so that's a really helpful example. And, and it shows the problem of sort of binary thinking around the vaccine, for example. The vaccination rates in the United States, are they're lower than they should be. It's 87 percent here in South Korea. I mean, so it's lower than it should be. But but what thing what has really sort of surprised me is the low third shot the low booster shot uptake. And maybe that's gotten better in certain states. But that's one of these problems, right? So you say, well, somebody's vaccinated. They were willing to go along with the science. They're not being selfish. But right. then we come with more information. We say, well, actually, if you get one more, then the chances are even better that you won't go to the hospital with Omicron and you won't overtax the health system. And please think about doctors and nurses and, and everybody else out there. And, um, and yet... That, that's a piece of data that sits there and says there's a lot of people who are willing to go so far, but no further. Well, are they selfish? And the use of that and Biden's use, the Biden administration's use of the concept of the pandemic of the unvaccinated. And, and I know, I, I think temperamentally, I'm, I'm with them on that. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's frame this as something that sort of appeals to people's sort of sense of get with the program, get with the team or the vaccine or the, the pandemic is about you and not about this group. But then I hear all the time the stories of people who just needed a little more information or a little more time or that something changed in their life or somebody in their life was pressuring them in one direction. And then, I mean, a million things can happen. So I, I'm with you. I'm worried about this sort of characterization of, of people. And I'm, I've been so angry at various points in this pandemic with those who particularly who have been cynical and have, have used uncertainty in science as a grift to sell products. But that's not everybody. Yeah. You know, I, I think there, in, in, in my most optimistic moments, I think that there is just a small percentage of the population that is unmovable on this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, there is evidence that, you know, a, a good percentage of the, or, or a decent percentage of the still unvaccinated need more information, need better access. I mean, we don't have universal health care in this country. So, you know, there are people who are just so disconnected from what we think of, you know, from our privileged places of just going to get a shot, whether it be in our workplace or at our um, local CVS or at our um, at our at our, you know, at our doctors. It's easy. But for a lot of people, it's not easy. Throw information into that mix and you've got a certain percentage of people who are, you know, still going to get vaccinated and there's still decent numbers of people who are getting vaccinated. Um, the immovable people concern me. Um, and I think, you know, those are the folks who are going to be hard um, no matter what. Uh, and, and that, that to me is where the selfishness comes in, particularly in, 
the you know the chattering class and in the politicians who have used this as a way to um, you know energize their base or also you know do great harm to their base in this moment. So it's it's just this crazy moment filled with contradictions that rationally don't make a lot of sense. It's going to take us a long time to disentangle this. Um, you know, I, I, I think I will not teach, you know, as, as a public health historian, um, you know, the, the bacteriological revolution where we started conquering, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these illnesses, both through, you know, some medical interventions, but also through public health interventions, um, doesn't look the same as it once did. It mm -hmm. just looks very different. Um, politics, selfishness, um, misinformation feel like much, much bigger issues today than I would have thought, you know, uh, just over almost two years ago to the day um, when things, you know, spiraled out of control. Let me just remind folks you're listening to COVID calls and talking to public health ethicist Michael Udell. Sorry, I've been running off and on screen. My son is uh, went to school, but it's it's election day here in South Korea and uh, public school is not is canceled today. So he was all ready for school uh, and showed up, but all didn't right. need to be there. So uh, that's that's a fail on dad's part. Um, let me uh, I want to pick up on one part of what you're saying. I think I know why you believe that people are mostly reachable and it has to do um, with the fact that you also are a person who engages in in comedy and improv. I actually <laughs> think, and this is my a philosophy of Michael Udall, I'm developing this right now, but I think you are a person who, who believes strongly the power of communication at multiple different levels. I know that about you. And so I wanted to bring, I wanted to actually talk a little bit about study hall and your attempts to continue that going and how that's worked and how you see comedy or uh, sort of other modes of communicating with people. In this time, I had comedian Kurt Brownoller on, and he was, and it was great. And he, he basically, he's a stand-up, and he said basically we couldn't do stand-up. It's just it, we couldn't do stand-up because we couldn't read the audience. The timing is off; we can't hear the laughter. Um, but he did; they didn't stop trying. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I wanted to ask you about that, and maybe you don't accept my characterization of of the, the way you think about communication. But uh, you're a unique individual in that you do try to communicate with people in so many different ways, including getting them to to laugh. Yeah. Um, so Study Hall is a show I've been doing with the Crossroads Comedy Theater for the last, uh, we are coming up on eight years now. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we did our sixth anniversary show three weeks before the pandemic hit um, in, in, in Philly. Uh, and then we went virtual. And, you know, the gag of the show, you've been a guest, so you know. Um, is, you know, uh, I and my guests tell true stories from history, from public health, from politics, from sports, you know, from business, and our group of uh, improv comics riff off of that um, and sort of weave stories around the stories we tell them. Um, and, you know, most of the stories I've told, you've told stories, you know, uh, can be about really serious topics. And the goal is to, you know, laugh and learn, to educate you know, people on a wide variety of subjects. I mean, I've told, you know, sort of, you know, classic, you know, wacky public health stories from, you know, the invention of the vulcanized rubber condom to the development of the porcelain bathroom um, to, you know, more wacky stories from history, like the day Elvis showed up at the White House to when Abby Hoffman and the hippies levitated, or at least claim to levitate the Pentagon. Um, you know, the goal is to bring history to people um, and to bring ideas to people in new ways. And, you know, I think public health, uh, you know, has to be more creative in its messaging. And, you know, here at ASU, we're developing connections with our college and um, our journalism school and our communications programs to try to do innovative things in this space. And I think that's sort of you know, one of the newer challenges for public health, particularly in the social media era, like how do we communicate? And there are certainly some stars who've emerged, you know, on Twitter over the last two years who've been great and consistent health communicators in that forum. You know, I like my little corner of the world where we do, you know, wacky improv and storytelling as well. 
Um, and we're actually going to start a podcast soon um, to, to continue to continue our efforts. But we did 20 shows virtually during the pandemic. Right. Um, and we're back to some live performances. Uh, I have been on some of them. We've had guests in Philly who've, you know, st stood in for me. Um, and I'll do some shows over the summer back in Philly. Um, but it's really a great way to, to, to continue to communicate. And yes, it does instill me with optimism um, by being able to, to reach the public more directly and consistently than, than we do through academic journals and blogs and Twitter. Is that a way or does that point towards a way to try to get back to some notion of consensus in America? I mean, again, people have gotten very hardened in certain views over these last two years, maybe even ideas that they didn't have before the pandemic started. Maybe they never thought about public health leadership before, but now all of a sudden they somehow think Tony Fauci is a bad guy or something like that. I mean, all people have developed all kinds of ideas and in this time. And I've been puzzling and asking people what they thought the road back was road back. America is a fractured country on many issues. It's on, you know, not going to be resolved and shouldn't be resolved easily. Still. I I'm, I'm a believer that we should be trying to find ways to achieve consensus, particularly on areas of life and death, like public health. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I look, uh, if you can book me a national study hall tour, I'm in. Uh, <laughs> okay, everybody, anybody who runs a venue listening right now, <laughs> you heard it here. Um, and and my director, Mike Marbeck, of course, uh, who all have listened to this would love that too. But, um, you know, the, the more creative we can be in the space, the better. And, you know, I think public health is in a funny place because, you know, schools or public health right now are seeing you know, an increase in, in students being drawn to the field because people want to jump in and make a difference. And public health is definitely a place to do that. But I think what public health needs to do um, and is being done in, in certainly, you know, corners of, of the field is to start to integrate, you know, political science into public health more directly. Like, you know, sort of what are the political implications of everything we do from the money we go after um, to fund our research to the types of questions we ask. And then of course, to how we communicate those questions, not just through our journal articles and blogs and Twitter, but directly to consumers of public health, to politicians who hold the purse strings for public health. I think we've, we've got a lot of work to do on that front. I also think we need to rethink as a field what our priorities are. And we have been talking about measuring health disparities in public health now for the better part of a few decades, yet the needle on many of those disparities has not moved. So what are we doing wrong? It's really time for a reevaluation and a time to think about, you know, what, what can we do not just to, to understand the challenges out there, but to agitate politically in a way that pushes us to some solutions. Because, I, you know, I, I would hazard to say that, you know, a lot of the public's resistance to public health isn't just ignorance of public health, but it's the fact that on the one hand, the successes of public health up until this point were largely invisible. And on the other hand, what people did know of public health, you know, was, the, you know, could be responded to in the question, what has public health done for me in a constructive way? And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not... I'm not sure if we're prepared to answer those questions in a positive way just yet. And I think the field, you know, the field needs a reckoning, what that will look like. Um, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure, but I, I, I do think we need to move past um, some of the narrower ways we understand uh, disparities, which is sort of takes up the most, you know, the most effort of public health right now to think more organically, going back to what W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about over a hundred years ago when he studied Philadelphia, to understand that problems are organic in nature. They are not just narrow um, and that we need to understand, and this was not his direct language, but you know, what he was talking about was understanding the, the different inputs, the different determinants, the different ways that health, education, housing, opportunities, and so on shape people's lives. We got to do a better job at that.
Uh, that you've said it very well, and I I think it's just got to be absolutely number one, you know, job one across public health community. In part because if the, another pandemic or disaster of this type comes up, I'm yeah. really worried about the capacity to use the police power again, the power to have mandates, the power to lock down mandates of masks or or any other kind of uh, you know non pharmaceutical intervention or you know vaccine mandates. Um, you know, those have been coming down and it's a lot easier for governors in blue states to take those down than they would be to bring them back up. And I really wonder if we, you know, the hypothetical is, you know, a COVID level event starts again two years from now. What do governors in, even in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, will they act the way that they did in the spring of 2020 and acting that way saved lives? But the politics, we've seen the whole movie now. And so I, I, I just, I guess I'm worried people are so exhausted, they're just going to, and I'm talking about the experts now, that they're going to want to just push past this a little bit. But I feel like now is absolutely the time that people need to be at work describing how bad it was, how many lives were saved by those interventions. And just as you've said very well, the problems of communication and the work left undone around inequality. It's yeah. a statement, not a question. So I, uh, I don't know if you want to say anything to that, but I mean, I yeah. just feel it's like, it, and here I am telling people who are t utterly exhausted. I'm like, please keep working harder than you were before. It's not really fair, but I feel like this is absolutely the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the, the, you use the word exhaustion a few times or exhausted. And I think, you know, that's, a, that's another variable in all of this that we need to, you not just for the public health professionals and the healthcare workers, but for the population, how do we navigate that going forward? And how do we plan for the next event? And you're right. We, we have to be doing that now. Um, you know, I, I sat in 2004 or five, I, I, I sat on a group that uh, Art Kaplan and his ethics group put together a pen to think about the ethics of, um, a flu pandemic, um, which was imagined as much more severe um, than what this looks like. Uh, and um, some, of, some of the issues that have popped up, I don't think were anticipated in either that discussion or in a century's worth of discussion since you know, whether, you know, uh, since the 1918-19 the flu, since HIV, since measles, whatever. Like, I think there have been new lights shown on some really tough issues. And we've, we as historians have to remind people repeatedly of these issues because the public is going to forget them very quickly. Just a quick reminder that you're listening to COVID Calls and I'm talking to Michael Udell today and we have just a, a couple of minutes left. Michael, I wanted to, um, uh, I, I meant to start with this question, but I'm gonna come back to it. And this actually has to do with, with scale. You're just talking about exhaustion, the problem of time, the disaster of this length and the problem of making sense of numbers. We talked a little bit about those numbers from April those numbers of April 2020 were were felt viscerally. There was the the terror of watching those counts go up in the way that you know people who know how pandemics operate were saying, yeah, it's gonna this is what's gonna do. But to actually see it unfolding. But now, you know, I had a guest yesterday who wrote a piece. Uh, David Adam wrote a piece for Nature talking about the excess deaths problem and just the counting problem. So at some point we went we crossed a threshold. Just the problem of large numbers. Maybe they cease to have the kind of cultural or even um, uh, scientific impact that we would hope they would have to surge help in various places to give us a greater handle on what's going on. So I guess I wanted to ask you about that, you know, that the problem of disasters that linger and the problem of numbers that get large, how do you think about those problems as in terms of public health and in, in the way you teach students, the way you communicate public health problems, how do you approach that? Well, in my most cynical way, we will look back someday at this disaster with horror and those numbers will look much more horrific years down the line than I think they do while we're in the middle of it because of all of the ways in which 
you know, whether it's exhaustion, selfishness, you know, just people being completely burned out um, or, or mediating and limiting people's ability to be horrified by what's going on. And there has been so much horror that I think people are in some ways numb to what is going on. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, people on the one hand, understand the horror, but they also want to live. I mean, two years is a long time to ask people to sort of suspend their lives. Um, we've obviously been through, you know, tougher times in our history where it's been more than two years, um, whether it be World War II or, you know, other awful eras in our history. Um, but the modern world moves at a fast clip and, and, and people have in some ways, you know, numb themselves to this and numb themselves to these numbers. I, I think it's only going to be in hindsight where that horror truly emerges and the, and the depth of loss and grief that people have felt that in the moment, you know, are localized. But I think, in, again, in my optimistic, and this is both optimistic and kind of awful way, um, people will be hit by what we've been through, but we're going to have to get out of it first. You're the first person who's who's made that point to, uh, that I've heard, and I think it's a powerful one. And it, I think it's, and I, and I know exactly what you're going for here, is I, and I do find some hope in that, that we can lose perspective now and regain it a bit later. And I think we have to, because I'm not giving up on the power of these just astounding numbers and the undercount. I mean, the numbers will get more refined as we go. Um that it's just unacceptable to have this many people die of anything, but certainly of things that can be ameliorated, that can be made easier. Um, and and, and people who were, I don't want to give up on that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I think there will be a reckoning. At, I, I, again, the optimistic part of me that there, that it's hard for me to believe that there won't be a reckoning of people who will someday discover that they were misled to not vaccinate and to not take care of themselves and that their loved ones either sacrificed themselves or were sacrificed by misinformation. Um, may, may, maybe that's too optimistic, but that's, that's the hopeful part of, you know, in, in a really terrible way, again, like the hopeful part of me that thinks people at some point step back and say, my God, like how, how could I have believed that my husband and I, you know, were somehow immune from this terrible virus because some, you know, jerk on Twitter or some politician trying to score cheap points told me that I would somehow be okay. And that that's a terrible, like that the, the thought of somebody having that realization is also a terrible feeling, right? Like there's just, you know, and may, may, maybe that's why people will never let go of this terrible moment and this terrible idea. But, you know, I think, Maybe they will. Maybe there, there will be that reckoning. I would just remind folks you've been listening to COVID calls and you can catch my next COVID calls episode starting in just a minute or so. I'll be talking to mental health expert Jesse Gold. So please do tune back in for that. I was really grateful to have this uh, bonus time with you, Michael. Uh, your friend and you're a mentor and a genius. And it was great to be with you and thanks for your support of COVID calls and uh, best of luck to you. And I know we'll keep talking about these issues for years, years to come. Thanks, Scott. Always great to chat with you. You know, just as a reminder, everybody listening, you've done a remarkable thing with, uh, well, you said it was the 455th COVID call over the last two years and the, the service, you know, you've done while this was ongoing, but also the service to history with the uh, archive of all these calls is, is just a remarkable feat. So thank you for, for doing this. Thanks, my friend. Stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you next time on COVID Calls.